Um, now I am happy to introduce Professor Rene Bloch from the University of Bern, who's going to talk about leaving home Jewish Hellenistic authors on the Exodus. And I see from his biography that uh, Professor Bloch is president of the board of the Swiss National Science Foundation. So we should all be very nice to him because he must be, dealing, he must be doling out millions and millions of uh, Swiss francs and dollars and Deutschmarks on a regular basis. Now I know I got invited. Uh, <laughs> but it's just the University of Bern, uh, Swiss National Science Foundation. Moses at the Burning Bush in chapter 3 of the Exodus book is one of the most dramatic scenes in the Hebrew Bible. All the necessary ingredients for a dramatic epiphany are at play. Moses, who is watching the flock of his father-in-law Jethro near the mountain Horeb, the mountain of God, becomes aware of a paradoxical scenery of nature. There is a flame of fire coming out of a bush, but that bush is not consumed by the fire. Moses hears a divine voice calling him by name and telling him to keep away from the sight. The scene of the burning bush is a classic example of how sacred space is created. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. This is the site where Moses is informed about the land where the Israelites will dwell in the future. It is here on sacred ground that the territory of Israel's future home is described and announced to Moses. In this fiery and, one can imagine, smoky scene of Exodus 3, the destination of Israel's future journey becomes clear. Exodus 3.8, God says, And I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, the land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This is the ticket. To leave no doubt about where the journey is going, the destination is repeated a little later in Exodus 3.17. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Among the many ancient Jewish authors who comment on and make use of this scene, the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria is particularly interesting. In his vast earth, Philo comes to talk repeatedly about the Exodus, most prominently so in his De Vita Moses, or Life of Moses, a fascinating Jewish Hellenistic rewriting of the biblical Moses narrative. In this tractate, the biblical scene of the burning bush is treated in detail and with quite a few additions. Philo reads the burning bush, which is not consumed by fire, as a symbol of the resistance of the Jewish people. Life of Moses 167, for the burning bush was a symbol of the oppressed people, and the burning fire was a symbol of the oppressors, and the circumstance of the burning bush not being consumed was an emblem of the fact that the people thus oppressed would not be destroyed by those who were attacking them, but that their hostility would be unsuccessful and fruitless to the one party, and the fact of their being plotted against would fail to be injurious to the others. Philo imagines that the biblical bush had thorns, almost anticipating the Israeli sabra self-image, tough on the outside, soft on the inside. He understands the plant as a symbol of the Jewish people, seemingly weak, but, quote, not without thorns, so that it wounds one if one only touches it, end quote, Moses, Vita Moses 168. The miracle that the bush was not devoured by fire refers in Philo's reading to the unchangeable nature of Judaism, a recurrent theme in Philo. To Philo, the biblical report on the burning bush that stands for Israel's strength in difficult times. God tells Moses, do not lose heart. Your weakness is your strength, which can prick, and thousands will suffer from its wounds. Read the Moses 169. As in the biblical version, God then strengthens Moses' limited self-confidence by showing him additional miracles and by assuring him that he would support Moses when it comes to rhetorics. To the Jewish people, Moses would not just be an assistant to their liberation, but a leader, hegemon, of their migration, apoikias. In comparison with the biblical report, there is something missing in God's speech to Moses and in the whole lengthy passage on the biblical scene of the burning bush. It comprises some 20 paragraphs. Where is Moses supposed to go? There is no mention of any destination. 
Philo's God tells Moses that he would, quote, soon become the leader of a migration from there and Tende, in other words, from Egypt. But God forgets to tell Moses where to take his people. All he's told is to, quote, make a three days journey beyond the bounds of the country and to sacrifice there. In this paper, I would like to ask what it meant for an author such as Philo of Alexandria to write on the Exodus, the biblical story of Israel's migration from Egypt to a better place. For Jewish Hellenistic authors, writing in Egypt, the Exodus story posed unique challenges. After all, to them, Egypt was, as Philo of Alexandria states, their fatherland, Patris. How does Philo come to terms with the biblical story of liberation from Egyptian slavery and the longing for the promised land? I'll focus on Philo for most of the paper. Towards the end of my talk, I will add two more examples from Jewish Hellenistic literature, the wisdom of Solomon and Ezekiel's Exodus tragedy, Exagoge. Perhaps a few biographical remarks on Philo are in order. As a matter of fact, there is not much one can say for sure about his life. In spite of his impressively large oeuvre, 37 tractates have survived, but he wrote quite a few more, very little can be said with certainty about his life and activities. Contrary to the other major literary figure of diaspora Judaism, Josephus, Philo very rarely speaks of himself and there is no autobiography. Even the dates of his life are debated. Philo was probably born around 20 BCE and died around 50 CE. Even when Philo discusses the so-called embassy to the Roman Emperor Caligula in the late 30s of the first century CE, of which he was most probably the leader, we learn very little about the author himself. Josephus has a few lines on Philo and his family, which indicate that Philo grew up in an upper-class Jewish family in Alexandria. The very existence of his large oeuvre implies that he must have enjoyed security and financial independence. Philo probably lived his whole life in Alexandria, which at the time was the intellectual center of Greek-speaking Judaism. In the context of the biblical report on Abraham's departure from Ur, Philo makes the point that, quote, men who have never traveled are to those who have, as blind men are to those who see clearly, end quote, De Abrahamo 65. One reason mentioned in De Abrahamo, which makes people travel, is, quote, the idea of being able to benefit their native city at its time of need in the most necessary and important particulars. Philo certainly lived up to this ideal when he participated in the Jewish embassy to Rome when the Jews of Alexandria were under attack by local Egyptians. We'll come back to this later. Philo was at least once in Jerusalem and visited the temple there, as he states in De Providentia 264. In Philo's understanding, Jerusalem is the metropolis or mother city of all the Jews, while their fatherland, Patris, is the place where they actually live. The locus classicus for this is in Flacum 64, in Peter van der Horst's translation. It is the holy city where the sacred temple of the Most High God stands that they, the Jews, regard as their mother city, but the regions they obtained from their fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and even more remote ancestors to live in, they regard as their fatherland, where they were born and brought up. To Philo, Alexandria in Egypt was certainly his fatherland. He refers to the city as our Alexandria. Philo repeatedly uses the Greek term apoikia when writing about the Exodus. Apoikia literally means settlement far from home, oikos, and then also, more generally, migration. By using the term apoikia, Philo is thus declaring Egypt as his home. According to Philo, Moses, who grew up in the royal family of the pharaoh, had the opportunity to make a political career in Egypt. But being the prototype of the ideal wise man, Moses showed no interest in the superficial symbols of power. In Philo's reading, it is at the scene of the burning bush that Moses is rewarded for his wise behavior and becomes the leader of the Jewish people. But again, what is the telos? What is the destination? Instead of making Moses explicitly the leader who would bring the Israelites to Canaan, Philo states that God gave Moses the whole world. Vita Moses 1, 157. And this is natural enough, for he, Moses, is a citizen of the world, on which account he's not spoken of as to be enrolled as a citizen of any particular city in the, inhabitable, in the uh, habitable world, since he very appropriately has for his inheritance not a portion of a district, but the whole world, cosmopolites. While the biblical text makes it very clear that Moses would lead the Israelites out of Egypt to the land of Canaan, Philo's Moses, right after he has been made the leader and savior of the Jews, is presented as, as a cosmopolitan citizen whose home is the whole world. 
Philo uses the term cosmopolites, citizen of the world, only eight times in his earth, but his understanding of the term is of great importance for his concept of the world and the law. According to Philo, as he states at the beginning of his tractate on the creation of the world, the law corresponds to the world and the world to the law, and therefore a man who is obedient to the law is by so doing a citizen of the world. For Philo, there is no difference between the law of nature and the law of Moses. Therefore, Moses must be a citizen of the world and not just of a specific city or land. The biblical narrative of a Moses who would not live to arrive in the promised land suited Philo's understanding of Moses as a cosmopolitan citizen. Moses reaches out beyond the limited territory. And it comes as no surprise when Philo, at the end of his tractate on Moses, does not stick to the biblical description of Moses' death. According to Philo, Moses is not buried in the valley in the land of Moab, as stated in Deuteronomy 34.6, but he migrates to heaven. Is it a coincidence that Philo uses the exact same language, entende apoikia, for Moses' last journey, and in God's announcement to Moses at the burning bush, a migration from there? While in the passage on the burning bush, it is, as we have seen, not clear where this apoikia, this colony, would go, now it is. The migration from there to heaven, Vita Moses 2, 288. God resolved Moses' quote, twofold nature of soul and body into a single unity, transforming his whole being into mind, pure as the sunlight. Moses becomes immortal and joins God. This is Moses' exodus in Philo. It is a spiritual journey towards God. It is not that the destination of the journey of the Israelites is not mentioned at all in Philo's life of Moses. In 1.163, Moses declares that he will lead the Israelites to, quote, Phoenicia and Coelisiria and Palestine, then called the land of the Canaanites, end quote. But the narrative in Philo's life of Moses does not focus on the promised land. Rather, it focuses on the point of departure. It focuses on Egypt. In Philo, Egypt is repeatedly described as a country to be avoided and to be left behind. Not in a geographic sense, though, or with a specific destination in mind, but from a philosophical point of view. For Philo, Egypt is a shift for the body. Egypt is a bodily land, a somatike chora. In her impressive monograph, The Land of the Body, studies in Philo's representation of Egypt, Sarah Pierce, has shown how for Philo, Egypt consistently symbolizes the material sphere, the land of the body. Pierce shows that, as she writes, Philo's representation of Egypt and Egyptians is predominantly negative, and that he tries consistently to differentiate the Jews and their ancestors from contemporary Egyptians and from the Egyptians of the Pentateuch. End quote. Pierce probably exaggerates somewhat the negative depiction of Egypt in Philo. At least in his life of Moses, there are certainly also attempts to stress some sort of an Egyptian Jewish symbiosis. Thus, Philo imagines for Moses an international education in Egypt. Wise teachers from different parts of the world come to the royal palace to assure first class education, starting with the Encyclius Paideia and leading to the most important field of study, philosophy. Among Moses' many teachers, Egyptian scholars are mentioned with praise. Nevertheless, Pierce is correct in stressing the overall negative Im image of Egypt in Philo. Egypt is, as Philo states once explicitly, the symbol, symbolon, of the body and of passion. Heavily influenced by Platonism, Philo repeatedly stresses the duality of body and soul, the former being a corpse, the tomb of the soul. Egypt stands for the body, and the Exodus stands for the migration of the soul from the body. When the Israelites departed from Egypt, they thus approached the higher stage of understanding. In a tractate entirely preserved only in Armenian, questions and answers on uh, the Exodus, Philo explains the etymology of Egypt, answering the question, why does the divine word say to Isaac, do not go down to Egypt, Genesis 26, 2. He states, quote, Egypt is to be translated as oppressing, for nothing else so constrains and oppresses the mind as to desire for sensual pleasures and grief and fear. But the perfect man, Isaac, who by nature enjoys the happiness of virtue, the sacred and divine word, recommends all perfection, not go down into the passions, but to accept impassivity with joy, bidding the passions a fond farewell. To avoid Egypt, 
or to leave Egypt behind, as in the Exodus, is in Philo's reading thus an allegorical way of saying goodbye to the body and its passions. The journey of the soul towards the world of God is a central theme, theme in Philo, and the Exodus was the obvious example for a symbolic reading of such a journey. For Philo, it seems to me, such a symbolic reading of the Exodus also allowed to keep the Exodus under control, so to speak, and to stay in Egypt. In his aforementioned treatise, Questions and Answers on Exodus, Philo asks and answers 147 questions on the book of Exodus, but nowhere is the destination of the Exodus mentioned. Philo's understanding of Egypt is thus ambivalent. Egypt was Philo's home, and he participated in the cultural life of Alexandria, as becomes obvious, for instance, when he describes his visits to the theater. But on the same, at the same time, his judgments of Egypt and Egyptians are often very negative. The Exodus is important to Philo, partly because of the allegorical message which, which he sees behind the story, but partly also, I would like to argue, because of some parallels between Egypt of biblical times and his own days. It seems to me that Philo's way of talking about Egypt is heavily colored by personal impressions. In an article in the Studia Philonica Annual, I have recently argued that Philo's Life of Moses, or at least parts of his tractate, can be read as a text in which Philo ponders on his own life, not the least his response to the anti-Jewish riot in Alexandria in the year 38. As a matter of fact, Philo's description of the suffering of the Israelites under the cruel Egyptian despots in life of Moses is very similar to his report on the suppression of the Jews at the time of the riot in the tractate Embassy to Caligula, or Legatio at Gaium. In his paraphrase of the biblical events in Egypt, Philo seems to plead on behalf of his fellow Jews in Alexandria. He uses the same vocabulary when he discusses the bestial brutality of the Egyptian overseers of the Israelites and of the Jews in his own time. The two emperors, the Pharaoh and Caligula, also described in a similar way, both sharing a tendency towards rage and injustice. But there is more. By going to Rome and plead at the emperor's palace on behalf of the Jews, Philo slips into the role of a Moses redivivus. Philo's legatio at Gaium is Moses' legatio at Pharaonim. Philo openly declares Moses as his paradigma. Moses is certainly out of reach, but he's Philo's constant point of orientation. At one point in his tractate, Embassy to Caligula, Philo recalls earlier times of suppression when God saved the people from hopeless and desperate situations. Philo does not go into details, but it is very possible, if not likely, that he has the Exodus story in mind here. When Philo writes about Moses and the Exodus, he's very much in Egypt. At times, Moses and Philo even merge into one person. They enjoyed the same kind of education and were both confronted with animosity in Egypt. Philo's main concern is Egypt. This is why Philo's God, when he talks to Moses in the scene of the burning bush, forgets to tell Moses where to go. In the remaining few minutes, I would like to uh, take a quick look at how other Jewish Hellenistic authors conceptualize uh, the Exodus. I will have to be very brief on this and will only hint at two other examples of Jewish Hellenistic literature, Wisdom of Solomon and Ezekiel's tragic play on the Exodus. Wisdom of Solomon, Sapientia, Salomonis, is a pseudepigraphic text which became part of the Septuagint. The author, most likely writing in Alexandria and possibly a contemporary of Philo, assumes the identity of King Solomon. The book, written in Greek, which shows both Hebrew and pagan influences, belongs to the Jewish wisdom literature. The book falls into three sections, of which the first compares the life of the righteous who seek wisdom with that of the wicked who first ridicules the values of Jewish wisdom, but then realizes that in the end, righteousness wins over injustice. The middle section of Wisdom of Solomon is an intense praise of wisdom in the name of King Solomon. The third and last section, important for our context, chapters 10 to 19, contrasts like the first righteous and wicked approaches to life, but this time the author presents examples from Israel's history. In the center of this third section is the biblical story of the Exodus and the destiny of the Israelites and the Egyptians. 
the author tries to show that the Egyptians are punished by the same means as the Israelites are delivered. The Egyptians try to kill Moses in the Nile, but in the end, their men drown in the water of the Sea of Reeds. God shows the Israelites the path to water in the desert, but makes the water of the Egyptians undrinkable. In the words of the author, this is uh, Sapientia Salomonis 11.5, for by those things whereby their enemies were punished, by these they, the Israelites, in their need, were benefited. A major critique in Wisdom of Solomon is, as in Philo, the Egyptian worship of animals. For this, too, the Egyptians are being punished adequately by the plagues. 11.15 of Wisdom of Solomon, but for the foolish reasonings of their unrighteousness, led astray by which they worshipped senseless reptiles and vile vermin, you sent upon them a multitude of senseless beasts for vengeance, that they might know that by what things a man sins, thereby he is punished. Another parallel with Philo, and this brings us back to our earlier argument, is the remarkable fact that in Wisdom of Solomon, after a detailed description of the suffering of the Israelites and the punishment of the Egyptians, the accidents does not really happen anyway. The Israelites don't go further than to the Sea of the Reeds. When they say that they remain in Egypt, Wisdom of Solomon ends somewhat abruptly with a statement about God's constant help for Israel at every time and place. This is Wisdom of Solomon 19.22. Some scholars suggested that the end of the book with the arrival in the promised land got lost in the tradition of the text. But this seems unlikely. Much more likely is another reason. As in the case of Philo, the author's main concern is Egypt. Let me add very briefly a third example of such a reluctance to really leave Egypt, the drama Exagoge by the Jewish Hellenistic poet Ezekiel. The play, probably also written in Alexandria, maybe in the second century BC, has only survived in fragments. However, the extant 269 Greek verses allow for more than a brief insight. The play sets out with typical dialogue, excuse me, a typical prologue, as we know it from many Greek tragedies. It is Moses himself who dares to enter the stage all alone, something the rhetorically challenged Moses of the Torah would never have done, and tells the audience, certainly not in Greek, and tells the audience of the beginnings of the Jewish people as well as his own origins. This is the beginning of the first fragment. And when from Canaan Jacob did depart, with 70 souls he did go down to Egypt's land, and there he did beget a host of people, suffering, oppressed, ill-treated even to this very day by ruling powers and by wicked men. We don't know whether this was the actual beginning of the play. It might very well be the case. In any case, Moses early on in the drama explains the Israelites' presence in Egypt. Jacob had left Canaan and migrated to Egypt, and Moses is a descendant of Jacob. Moses then reports how he was saved by the Egyptian princess and how, after having killed an Egyptian, he had to flee and how he met the daughters of Raguel, that is Jethro. This part only exists in fragments. But of Ezekiel's version of the biblical scene of the burning bush, a substantial part has survived. Strikingly, here too, God does not tell Moses where to go. Exodus 1, 12, now go and testify to these my words to all the Hebrews first, then to the king, the things commanded by me unto you, that you should lead my people from this land. A little later, verse 167, God speaks of the destination as your own land. But the name of the destination is not mentioned here or anywhere else in the surviving fragments. In the drama, there is certainly a movement out of Egypt, and towards the end, there is mention of recounts by scouts who visited the land. But to Ezekiel, what happened in Egypt seems to be of more importance. In what seems to have been the fourth act of the play, there is a long speech by an Egyptian messenger, apparently the only survivor of the Egyptian disaster at the Sea of Reeds. He, the Egyptian soldier, tells the probably mostly Jewish audience in Alexandria, which must have enjoyed this scene, how armed forces of the Pharaoh had no chance against the Israelites. Too late did the Egyptian rea Egyptians realize that, quote, God was their defense. As in Wisdom of Solomon, this is a central message of the text. The wrongdoers are punished for their unjust behavior and the righteous prevail. We have looked at three Jewish Hellenistic forms of rewriting the Exodus, Philo's Life of Moses, and very briefly, Wisdom of Solomon and Ezekiel's Exagoge. In many ways, the three examples could not be more different from each other. 
Philo's Life of Moses is a philosophical biography. Wisdom of Solomon is a piece of wisdom literature. And Ezekiel's drama is a Hellenistic tragedy. But the three authors, who most probably all wrote in Egypt, have in common that in their rewriting of the Exodus, they remain very much in Egypt and barely let the Exodus happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Renee. I would like to open the floor to questions. There's some arms up. OK, start asking questions. Uh, Scott Nagel. Thank you for that uh, fascinating talk. Uh, my question has to do, you touched upon audience. And I wonder if you could elaborate on what Philo's audience or audiences were, whether intended or perceived. And also, if these audiences would have uh, caught some of the personal or maybe um, symbolic elements that are that he sort of embedded in his his um, um, allegories. Yeah. Um, well, that is a, a question that has been discussed quite a bit, and I don't think there's a consensus. Um, it seems to me that Philo has mainly uh, a Jewish audience in mind. Um, that he's writing to uh, Jewish readers. In the case of Life of Moses, um, it, it has often been said that this is not the case. This is, uh, some scholars have even said, this is some sort of proselytism. 